Good morning. morning. You look so settled and warm, and guess what? I'm going to make you go outside for a little bit. Now, if you're not able to go outside, that's fine. I'm going to keep this on so you'll be able to hear. Uh, Howell's going to stay inside because we're going to process in to all glory, laud, and honor, which I know you've been practicing all weekend uh, for that. We'll be outside just for a few minutes. I know how cold it is, so I'm going to eliminate one of the one of the prayers out there, as long as Father Sam doesn't tell the bishop, it, <laughs> he will. <laughs> he will. Um, so if, if you could, if you're able, if you've got little babies and you don't want to go outside, or, or, uh, or a big baby who doesn't want to go outside, um, but we're going to go right outside to Hoops Court. So if you uh, just sort of flow outside. Jeff, why don't you open both doors so people can get out easy. Oh boy, there's spots in the shade. <laughs> no, no, I'm gonna bless him right now. We're gonna do it. And then you can bring him in. Okay, we have unruly disciples here. Jesus had unruly disciples. Okay, let us pray. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory. Let us pray. Assist us mercifully with your help, O Lord God of our salvation, that we may enter with joy upon the contemplation of those mighty acts, whereby you have given us life and immortality through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A reading from St. Mark. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage in Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this, The Lord needs it, and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door, outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, it was already late. And he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to praise you, Almighty God, for the acts of love by which you have redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. On this day, he entered the holy city of Jerusalem in triumph and was proclaimed as King of Kings by those who spread their garments and branches of palm along the way. Let these branches be for us a sign of his victory and grant that we who bear them in his name 
may ever hail him as our king and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life, who lives and reigns in glory with you and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let us go forth in peace. In the name of Christ. Okay. Oh, well. can process it. Jacob, you can start going in. You can go, yeah. Our liturgy of the word this morning will begin on page five in our service program this morning. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. The Lord be with you. Let's pray our contemporary colic. You'll find that in a small insert in your bulletin. Almighty and ever living God. In your tender love for the human race, you sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to take upon him our nature and to suffer death upon the cross, giving us the example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may walk in the way of his suffering and also share in his resurrection. 
through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for our readings. The reading from the Old Testament is from Isaiah chapter 50, verses 4 through 9. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher, that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear to listen to those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near, who will contend with me. Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them comfort me. It is the Lord God who helps me, who will declare me guilty. The word of the Lord. The psalm for this morning is Psalm 31, verses 9 through 16. Let us read it together by whole verse. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. My eye is consumed with sorrow, and also my throat and my belly. For my life is wasted with grief, and my years with sighing. My strength fails me because of affliction, and my bones are consumed. I have become a reproach to all my enemies and even to my neighbors, a dismay to those of my acquaintance. When they see me in the street, they avoid me. I am forgotten like a dead man out of mind. I am as useless as a broken pot. For I have heard the whispering of the crowd, fear is all around. They put their heads together against me. They plot to take my life. But as As for me, I have trusted in you, O Lord. I have said, you are my God. My My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Make Make your face face shine shine upon your servant. And in your your loving kindness, kindness, save me. The epistle this morning is from Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of the Father. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Mark. Please be seated. This morning, the congregation will take the part of the crowd in our reading. The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ According to Mark It was two days before the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. For they said, Not during the festival, or there may be a riot among the people. While Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment of nard, and she broke open the jar and poured the ointment on his head. But some were there who said to one another in anger, Why was the ointment wasted in this way? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii, and the money given to the poor. And they scolded her, but Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me. For you always have the poor with you, and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray Jesus to them. When they heard it, they were greatly pleased and promised to give him money. So Judas began to look for an opportunity to betray Jesus. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, Jesus' disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go to make the preparations for you to eat? So Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. So the disciples set out and went to the city and found everything as Jesus had told them. And they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, Jesus came with the twelve. And when they had taken their places and were eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be distressed, and to say to him, one after another, Surely, not I. Jesus said to them, It is one of the twelve who is dipping bread into the bowl with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would be better for that one not to have been born. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to the disciples, and said, This is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and to all of them drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. Truly I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine, until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, You will all become deserters, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this day, this very night, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. But Peter said vehemently, I will not deny And all of the disciples said the same. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to the three disciples, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little farther, Jesus threw himself on the ground and prayed that, if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, 
For you, all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. Jesus came and found the disciples sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you might not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again Jesus went and prayed, saying the same words. And once more he came and found the disciples sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to say to him. Jesus came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest enough? The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hand of sinners. Get up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Immediately, while Jesus was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. And with him there were a crowd, was a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Now the betrayer had given the crowd a sign, saying, The one who kissed is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. So when Judas came, he went up to Jesus at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then the crowd laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. But one of those who stood near drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to them, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. All of Jesus' followers deserted him and fled. A certain young man was following Jesus, wearing nothing but a linen cloth. The crowd caught hold of him, but he left the, left the linen cloth and ran off naked. They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chiefs, the priests, the elders, and the scribes were assembled. Peter had followed Jesus at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards, warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many gave false testimony against him, and their testimony did not agree. Some stood up and gave false testimony against Jesus, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made in hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. But even on this point, their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, And you will answer, What is it that they testify against you? But Jesus was silent and did not answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, Why don't we still need witnesses? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? The whole council condemned Jesus as deserving death. Some began to spit on him, to blindfold him, and to strike him, saying to him, Prophecy. The guards also took Jesus over and beat him. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she stared at him and said, You also were with Jesus, the man of Nazareth. But Peter denied it, saying, and Peter went out into the forecourt. Then the cock crowed, and the servant girl, on seeing him, began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again Peter denied it. Then after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are God in the land. But Peter began to curse, and he swore an oath. I do not know this man. At that moment, the cock crowed for the second time. Then Peter remembered that Jesus had said to him, Before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And Peter broke down and wept. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes in the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, 
Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, You say so. Then the chief priests accused Jesus of many things. Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival, Pilate used to release a prisoner for them, anyone for whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during their insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. Then Pilate answered them, Do you all need to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed Jesus over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again. Then what do you wish me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? The crowd shouted back. Crucify him. Pilate asked them. Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more. Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, Pilate handed him over to be crucified. But then the soldiers led Jesus into the courtyard of the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole cohort. And they clothed Jesus in a purple cloak. And after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him, and they began saluting him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They struck his head with a wreath, spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. The soldiers compelled a passerby, who was coming in from the country, to carry Jesus' cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then the soldiers brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And the soldiers crucified Jesus and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified Jesus. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with Jesus, they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided Jesus, shaking their heads and saying, In the same way, the chief priests, along with the scribes, were also mocking Jesus among themselves and saying, He saved himself, he cannot save, he saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now, so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with Jesus also taunted him. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, Listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to Jesus to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way Jesus breathed his last, he said, Truly this man was God's son. There were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James the Younger, and of Joseph and Solomon. 
These used to follow Jesus and provided for him when he was in Galilee. And there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. When evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate wondered if Jesus was, were really already dead. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether Jesus had been dead for some time. When Pilate learned from the centurion that Jesus was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph bought a linen cloth, and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. Joseph then rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where the body was laid. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. We have sort of this unusual day, day today with the Passion Gospel and, and Palm Sunday. Years ago in our 1928 prayer book, uh, Passion Sunday would be the fifth Sunday of Lent years ago. And then Palm Sunday would follow and then Easter. I know uh, those of you who come from the Roman Catholic tradition, it would have been the same way Vatican II back in the mid-60s changed it around. So the this Sunday of Lent would have been the Passion Gospel, then Palm Sunday, and then, and then Easter. So I invite you today to turn to the portion of Scripture that I read earlier on, on Hoops Court in Mark chapter 11. If you have a pew Bible that you might be sitting on, it's on page 823. What we have here in Mark 11 is, is Mark's contribution to the story of this day that we refer to as Palm Sunday. Matthew, Luke, and John, they also provide their own accounts. And if you read them, you'll find a comprehensive idea of what was taking place for us, provided by all the gospel writers. It's very familiar material to us on a superficial level. Consequently, it presents uh, us in studying it with peculiar difficulties. One is the difficulty of familiarity, because we feel that we know what this is all about. Some may come today without really seeking any kind of explanation, certainly no anticipation of transformation, a kind of transformation that would begin first of all in our minds and then follow in the detail of our lives. So we need to guard against that this morning. The notion in the back of our minds, we say, well, we know all this stuff already. We've been to lots of Palm Sunday services. There's nothing really for me to know. The other side is an, is an equal danger uh, it's a danger that presents itself uh, to, to anyone who has the privilege of teaching the Bible, and that's the danger of creativity, a kind of creative flair that, that can be dangerous along with that exaggeration often by the person talking about it, which could lead to exasperation on the part of people who are listening. The kind of thing I'm referring to is uh, the person who stands up and says, we're going to deal with a Palm Sunday record this morning from the perspective of the donkey and then proceed to get inside the mind of the donkey, which of course is not too difficult in certain cases, and leaves everyone high and dry. It's a foolish idea, but, uh, but I've, I've heard this kind of thing before. And as I studied Mark 11 this week, I realized how I was influenced by the headings in the Bible. Every one of the Gospels, the material that is before us this morning, comes under the heading of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And I thought about it, is that really, was it really a triumphal entry? And I determined it's not a triumphal entry at all. It's a dramatic entry. It's a story of a dramatic approach. This process of going up to Jerusalem just a few miles from Bethany, it's dramatic in every respect, but in actual fact, St. Mark's accounts of the events of the final entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, as we see in our last verse, verse 11, has a very quiet ending to the story. He went into the temple, he looked around at everything, and he said to his friends, I think it's quite late, I think we should go home now. That's how it ends. Immediately, immediately that's a personal perspective, but it's the kind of thing I'm talking about. 
I realize how we can be influenced uh, by a familiar sermon point on Palm Sunday. One is the fickleness of the, of the crowd. Often there's a Palm Sunday sermon that we hear where the crowd was going down the road shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. And then they do a 180 and they, they say again, crucify, crucify, crucify. Next, the point is made that the crowd was fickle and we're, a, we're fickle today in church. And the more I studied it, I'm not sure that point is well made. I'm not sure it can be substantiated that we find a fickle crowd. I think what we discover is that there are essentially two crowds being mentioned. One is the crowd described here in Mark 11 in these events that comes from Bethany, from the surrounding areas in journeys with Jesus to Jerusalem. But upon arriving, we, we do meet a very different crowd. We meet a crowd that's totally opposed to Christ. Many of them influenced directly by Pharisaical Judaism. Those then become the proponents of the crucified story in the Passion Gospel, drowning out the cries we find here in Mark 11. So I'd like to take a fresh look at the subject, and that's what I want to encourage us to do today. You know, in the real estate world, if there's three things that are important, it's location, location, location. As we study the Bible, uh, we know that there are three things that are also important. Context, context, and context. In verse 32 in chapter 10, it's right in that, it's page 823, right in our pew Bible. Because I want to sort of bookend what I'm going to talk about here from passage before and then the passage after. In verse 32 of chapter 10, it says, they were on their way up to Jerusalem. Jesus was leading the way. It says the disciples were amazed and those who followed were afraid. Those are two very important verbs, aren't they? Amazed and afraid. But because they're telling us not only that there was a crowd that was heading to Jerusalem, but Jesus was leading the charge. And we went up and thought about it, what was happening in the minds of the disciples. We decided, as you read it, that they were astonished. They were bewildered by what was happening. The overwhelming element in their mind was out of fear. So in light of that, we're told, Jesus takes his disciples aside and he makes a clear prediction of what's going to happen to him in Jerusalem. Chapter 10, verse 33, he says, We're going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be betrayed into the, to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death. They will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him, kill him. Three days later, he will rise. So the disciples in their astonishment and in their bewilderment are given by the Lord Jesus himself another clear prediction as to what's going to take place when they go up to Jerusalem. Keep this in mind because of what happens next. Our, our two friends here, our disciples James and John, they muster up the courage to ask questions requiring position of prominence. May I sit at your right hand? May I sit at your left hand? A position of significance. Jesus establishes his kingdom, Jesus points out to them, this is a really very bad idea on your part. Verse 43, he provides a vital instruction to them. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be the slave of all. So now here in this important instruction for even the son of man, he's referring to himself. Even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. So we go from one scene to the next scene to, the, to another scene, which is in Jericho. It's the story of Bartimaeus, the dramatic events with Bartimaeus, shouting from his position as a beggar at the side of the road, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. We have the story of this total transformation in the life of Bartimaeus. And if I bookend this and jump way ahead to verse 12 in today's gospel, which we don't have in our reading, again, the same page, Skip a portion with ours for a moment and set the context on the back end of this. Even when he reached uh, Jerusalem, the following day, what happened there? The events we're about to describe. Jesus enters the temple that following day. He drives out the money changers, those who were buying and selling. He overturns the tables and the benches of those selling doves that wouldn't allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. He says, but you have made it a den of robbers. You may recall I preached on this passage on March 3rd. So we have these unusual passages on either end of our gospel reading today. 
It's important, I think, because all throughout America today, there may be wonderful little sermons from the verses that are before us in Mark 11, if someone's preaching on it. Jesus is peaceful. He's, he's a lovely Jesus. Of course, he's a cozy Jesus, which, of course, he is peace-loving and lovely. But he's also the Christ that within 24 hours of arriving in Jerusalem enters the temple and he clears it out. Loved ones, we cannot have a Christ of our own concoction. We cannot have another Christ of our own <coughs> selective discovery. It's the same Jesus who rides into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, who having dismounted the following day, goes into the temple and says, you guys are out of here. Where do you think you're going with all this stuff? Don't even walk through here. Get out. People will be saying, who does he think he is? We liked him better on the donkey. We don't like him now. People say, well, I like to think of Jesus in this way. I like this, this kind and comfortable Jesus in this way. The only Jesus we have any valid validity in believing is the Jesus presented to us in the Bible. And we must always allow the Bible to interpret the Bible. So preventing us from creating notions which are absolutely invalid. So context, <clears throat> excuse me, is important. So finally, John, you're taking a long time with this. Finally, we come to our verses for today. Jesus lets his disciples know that it's going to be a different kind of journey to Jerusalem. He tells the disciples he's going to ride into Jerusalem. It's perfectly possible that the disciples would look at one another with a twinkle in their eye and said, this is terrific. This is the kind of thing we're hoping for. There you go, Jesus, riding into Jerusalem. This is a picture of triumph, a picture of a authority and power. They would have looked at one another and said, finally, we're going to get, let these people know exactly who Jesus is and what he's come to do. And Jesus is like, no, don't let your minds run away with you. Let me tell you, I'll be riding in and I want you to go now and get that beast. I'll be riding. You'll find a colt tied there. No one's ever ridden on this particular little donkey. I want you to go and get the donkey and bring it back. Well, the air's immediately out of their balloon, isn't it? All of a sudden, they're inflated with the prospect of this great entry into Jerusalem, only to, to discover he's going to ride a donkey. You can see the two of them heading off, two of them. Dispatch one saying to the other, you know, when he said he was going to ride into Jerusalem, I said, this is going to be fantastic. I wasn't thinking he's riding on a donkey. The other fellow said, well, oh, really, it wasn't a huge donkey, at least. This is the kind of conversation they could have talked about. <clears throat> Don't think of them walking down the road to Jerusalem the way that religion presents itself. These are ordinary men trying to figure out, and they can't figure it out. St. John tells us in, in chapter 12 in his record, that at first the disciples didn't understand all of this. They could not put the pieces together. The story of mocking and spitting and death on the part of his opponents, and now he's going to be riding a donkey. Verse 8 tells us as a result of his having ascended to this position of pomp, all be lowly pomp, they began to spread their cloaks on the road. This wasn't unfamiliar. Some spread branches creating a kind of festival, a great festive pilgrimage for Jesus and others. They're making their way towards Jerusalem. And so the cloaks and the, and the branches flood the road and the cries, cries of the crowd fill the air. The cries of Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Familiar to many of these people. This comes from Psalm 118, which is in our insert and in our Bible. So I'll set this in context for us. They're shouting the last of the Hallel Psalms. These are Psalms of praise. They were recited at all the major festivals in Jerusalem. Please notice how much of the Psalm we already know without realizing we knew it. Verse 22, the stone the builders had rejected had become the chief cornerstone. Also, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And so on. This is what the people chose to chant. So if I go back and look at Mark 11 here in verse 10, we find a line in there that's not in Psalm 118 that these people are saying. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Oh, I thought that was sort of interesting. That's, where did that come from? How are they saying this? Well, actually, it comes from a whole jumble of influences. 
The crowds that are gathered there in Jerusalem, they're there to rejoice in the past of what God has done and to anticipate of what God may yet do. They're there in order to call upon the Lord from his temple. They're there to hear God speak. And we might imagine they're there with the hope of liberation, this national political liberation. The Romans are there, recall. In many cases, totally misunderstood the possibilities of spiritual redemption. So they put together all these little bits and pieces, and it's no surprise there that in verse 10, they've determined that perhaps this kingdom of our ancestor David will come. And we can be done with the kingdom of this world. Somebody may have said, you know, Jesus, who's coming in here on a donkey, he's talked about a kingdom. At the end of the, end of the road, Jesus enters the temple. Speaking directly to the group that have gathered with him, he says, it's too late for anything this evening. Go back to, let's go back to Bethany. So our last verse today, verse 11, what is Jesus doing now in verse 11? I think he's surveying the battle scene. He's surveying the battle scene on which he is to suffer and die. The Mount of Olives is close by. He's looking now into the face of the future. Loved ones, please understand, this is the picture of Christ looking towards atonement. Many of us miss the anguish that's in this. When Jesus awakened on that morning and his eyes looked up at the ceiling in those early moments of consciousness, perhaps he said to himself, now what has this day, day hold for me? He realized he was 24 hours closer to all of the agony and pain and vilification, which was to be his as the very suffering servant of God. He sits on this donkey in this paradoxical pomp of the king of the universe, the king of the universe who made the donkey, created the heavens, fashioned the very DNA of everyone who looked at him. He makes his way up there, he dismounts, and he stands and views the scene. He's looking across the battle of all time. He's looking across the battle of the ages. He's about to wage war for all of us here in this congregation this morning, for our souls, for our eternal destiny so that we may understand what is being cried out of Psalm 110. Oh Lord, save us. Oh Lord, grant us success. Have you ever cried out to God to save you? To grant you the kind of success that has nothing to do with your job, your retirement, nothing to do with how bright your family is, nothing to do with your bank balance, but the kind of success that answers the deepest longings and cries of the human heart for meaning and for forgiveness and for freedom from guilt. These are the two questions that are begged in the description of our gospel today. One is, what does all of this mean? And the second is, why should any of this matter? If you're a thinking person here this morning, especially if you've been dragged along, what you're thinking right now is, what does all this mean? Why should it matter? I thought there'd be more palm branches. And you, pastor, please get me out of this dreadfully long sermon, which we're hoping now is about to stop. Loved ones, this matters so much. I am disheartened. I am sad to think of anyone walking out of here not knowing how much this matters. And why does it matter? It matters because eternity is in focus. It matters because it's just as easy today to lose oneself in the crowd. Even an enthusiastic crowd, even a crowd that can quote the Bible, sing the Bible, read the Bible, proclaim the Bible, to be lost in a crowd, to employ our voices in what essentially our empty chance, the empty chance of religious orthodoxy without ever knowing the reality of that to whom they point. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. We'll continue on now with our prayers of the people. Let's pray for the church and for the world. The prayers of the people this morning are form two, found in the, on page 385 in our book of common prayer. Please don't hesitate to say any prayer silently or aloud. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for our President Joe and our Governor Wes, for our presiding Bishop Michael, 
and, bis and Bishop Santaj for this gathering and for all ministers and people. Today in the diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for the Reverend Dr. Nicholas and his spouse Jane, the wardens, vestry, and people of St. Stephen's, Earlville. Pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the sick, the poor, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. We pray especially for those in extended care and at home. This morning we pray especially for Kathleen Abrams, Adams, Jessica Johnson, Jeannie Schaefer, Janice Flood, Diane Cottrell, and Kay Fisher. Please pray for those in any need or trouble. Please add your own petitions. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of him. Pray that they may find and be found by him. We ask the Holy Spirit to guide and support June Woody, Robin Holly, and the Holly family, the Flood family, Ruth Shores, all those in the military, Andrea and Vaughn, and we ask this Holy Spirit to guide all those in recovery. I ask your prayers for the departed especially William Hensley, the victims of the shootings in Moscow, all the victims of the wars in Israel, Palestine, Ukraine, Russia, and the Sudan. Please pray for those who have died. I ask your prayers for the parents expecting the birth of children, especially Matthew and Emily Miller, Laney and Peter, Taylor and Ben, Dee and Joshua, Becca and David, Chloe and Randy, Michelle and Jonathan. This morning we want to also give thanks to our flower committee for our Palm Sunday decoration to God's glory. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let's offer one another a sign of God's peace. Peace. <laughs> yeah, that helps. He misses Natalie. Yeah, we all do. Good morning. Please be seated. We have so much going on today and this coming week. You're going to need more coffee. So, and speaking of coffee, we have coffee and cake over at our parish hall, so everyone is welcome to, uh, to come over there. Uh, there's a little table set up, because we've got a garden market coming up in, in May, and if you'd like to learn more about that and to sign up for some things, you're welcome to come over there. Today we have a very special event. We have a young performers concert right here in the church at, at 3 o'clock. These are students of some of our, uh, some of our teachers, Hallel being, being one of them. And so we'll have professional musicians and also the students. It's just a wonderful event. It's about 90 minutes long. Uh, it's free admission, but donations are, 
are suggested to uh, benefit the musicians and also our music ministry. So if you can come at three o'clock, it's, it's just a, a wonderful thing. And we've got bubbles too. I feel like, <laughs> you're, you're not gonna know this. Yeah, Lawrence Welk, yeah, I know, don't be know. <laughs> Thank you, boys. Uh, anyway, so that's, that's today. Uh, there's a whole, a whole Holy Week, say that five times fast, Holy Week uh, list uh, of all of the different things from evening prayer. We have a special healing prayer service on, on Tuesday evening at 6. We'll have music. We'll be anointing with, with oil. We'll be praying specifically for people on our prayer list. It's going to be a wonderful event. So I hope you can come and support those who need prayer. And uh, prayer, not only uh, people who are here, but prayer for people in your life. So that's at 6 o'clock. Howell will be here with us uh, for that uh, also. On Wednesday, we have a labyrinth. Uh, some, of, some of us uh, have a contemplative nature uh, about us, and we'll have a labyrinth on two, two occasions, two times in the parish hall. It'll be a labyrinth-led prayer that's, that is, uh, is part of our, our Holy Week uh, from 12 to 2 and, and then from uh, 5 to 7. All of that's listed in the, uh, in the bulletin. Thursday is Monday Thursday service here at 6.30. That follows with the stripping of the altar and then the night watch where we sit uh, as, as, as we would, where Jesus asks us to sit and pray with him. And we'll be sitting here. We'll have a garden of repose that's here. We have uh, a, uh, a sign-up sheet that's here. And uh, there's some spaces on there. So if you'd like to come, it's a wonderful time. I've, I've done it in, in, often in the past to be able to sit in church quietly for an hour or so and to just pray and to uh, pray for, for, uh, for, for peace, to pray for those in your family, to pray, uh, pray for our faith. Uh, so if you can come, uh, we'll give this to one of you. One of you, got, Mac, maybe you can take this uh, and, and bring it out here and have people sign up uh, for that. Friday, we have our Good Friday service at noon also with music and uh, and then Sunday, three services on, on Easter Sunday morning at 6.30. If you're coming to our 6.30 service, you need to bring a blanket and a fire <laughs> with you because it will be cold outside near the, uh, near the river. Uh, so 6.30, uh, that'll be on. If you've never sat on a cold metal folding chair in 30 degree weather, this will be a treat for you. <laughs> it's good. Well, <laughs> That's what? Yeah, uh, what, what, what a pitch, yeah, what a pitch. Or you can bring your own chair, your own heated chair. So, let's see. So, announcements, so take the bulletin home with you, put it up on your fridge or on your bathroom mirror, lots of things to, to think about, services to attend, people to pray for, so I hope you're, you're, you're a part of that. Um, and, yeah, coffee hour I mentioned. Do I get everything? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Lots to do. I'm sorry I had to ramble on there. But take the bulletin home with you and it's fine. Any birthdays or anniversaries today? Jenny? Mary Blomquist? We prayed for Mary at 8 o'clock. We can pray for her here too. Right, Mary Blomquist is one of the... Uh, one of our flower committee people who did these beautiful decorations and wait till you see what's coming on Easter. I'm sorry? Right, yeah, she brings her, her doggy, uh, therapy dog around to different places. Yep. So, Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for Mary. We thank you for her life. We ask this blessing on her birthday. We ask you to be with her and watch over her always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good. Good. Okay. Jill. Well, it is Holly and Brad's anniversary today. Holly and Brad's anniversary. How many years? Uh, 16. 16 years of wedded bliss. Sam, yeah, Sam, married. Sam married. Oh, that, that if Sam married them, then he gets to say the blessing. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he doesn't look. Holly and Brad. Holly and Brad. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. Remember Holly and Brad? Very good. 16 years ago? Yes, sir.
and uh, the witness will continue all blessing on you. Amen. This day and always, this day of your anniversary and all the news to come. It's all my friend. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice for God.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord. For our sins he was lifted high upon the cross, that he might draw the whole world to himself. And by his suffering and death, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who put their trust in him. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. and gracious Father. In your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night that he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is God. Christ is risen. Christ is God. We celebrate the memorial of our redemptional Father in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace, and at the last day bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, and by him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you. Feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Also the body of Christ, the blood of the Lamb. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. 
blood of Christ keep you in eternal life. <coughs> blood of Christ. Blood of Christ and cup of salvation. Oh, we're awake now. JJ, the body of Christ. Maybe be. May the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you, lift up his countenance upon you, and give you peace. Give it back. In the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. In the body of Christ, the body of Christ, the body of Christ. This was in the body of Christ that was broken for you. Not the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. You be the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. So in the body of Christ, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. I have the body of Christ that is broken for you. And the Father, I share blessing upon Robin and ask you to be with her and watch over her and her family. Be with her in her grief this time. Let her know of your love and comfort her and give her strength. The blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you.
charge the body of Christ. Charge the body of Christ. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, to the Holy Spirit, the honor and glory now and forever. Amen. 
Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this, your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and to be given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. And the peace of God that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds and knowledge and love of God, our Father, and of his Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Our closing hymn is Ride On with Majesty. wish you a blessed Holy Week. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.